Welcome back to Third Academy. This is a Monday mini tutorial and today we are talking about how the cypherpunk movement kind of helped to start Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency and an electronic payments system and kind of how that shifted into what we know today as uh, Web3. So cryptography is really the ability to encrypt messages and have a secure form of communication that's not open to the public. So basically using code and cipher in order to um, cover up a message. And, you know, throughout history, kings, queens, people in power use these uh, forms of messaging in order to win wars and um, do lots of different things, right? Uh, a few books that you can read if you're interested in the history. Uh, one is The Code Book, which is the science of secrecy from ancient Egypt to quantum cryptography. The other is Cryptography, the Key to Digital Security, How It Works, and Why It Matters. And the other one is uh, The Mathematics of Secrets, Cryptography from Caesar Ciphers to Digital Encryption. So um, before computers, people would make like handmade tools. And there's something called a Videnieri chart where you basically make a chart and it has a bunch of different letters on it and based on the placement of the letters if you have a uh, specific word that was given to you then you can encrypt the message that you have there's um, many different forms of actually doing it that have been um, decoded now uh, but throughout history there's, there's a lot of secret writers that also used um, I would say secret writing in order to encrypt messages and different forms of decoding those messages so as we got further into having, you know, greater and more powerful electronics, uh, people were using algorithms and advanced mathematics in order to um, have more of more encryption that really wasn't easily or as easily um, detected. So before 1975, the NSA or the National Security Agency was really um, the party that had uh, cryptography or the ability to uh, encrypt their messages in a digital way. And that really wasn't open to the public. So individuals like you and me or um, other groups of people really weren't able to use that. It was basically more of like a government uh, thing. In 1975, 31-year-old Whitfield Diffie uh, came up with public key cryptography. He wanted to create a solution to privacy where the individual held their own keys so people could send information digitally without it being public. He was able to look into the future and see that people would be not only communicating but also conducting business uh, through digital means like on the computer and would actually need a lot of that in to be private and not public. So uh, encryption in the form of public key cryptography was actually very important going forward for individuals and businesses. Uh, but at the time, um, the NSA really didn't like that. They wanted to be the only ones, of course, that had access to um, that kind of uh, encryption because they called it a security risk for individuals and other people to have access to um, that form of private communication. David Kahn, the author of The Code Breakers, called public key cryptography the most revolutionary new concept in the field since the Renaissance. So really it went like to secure a message, the sender encrypts it with the receiver's public key. In order to decipher the message, the receiver uses their private key. And then they could also use that as a form of verification. Uh, so the sender can encrypt a message with their private key and the receiver can decode that message with the public key, verifying that it was from the original sender. And uh, as we go further to talk more about why this actually relates to Bitcoin, we will get on to public keys and private keys, but you may already know a form of this in terms of your cryptocurrency wallet, right? If you sign up to a MetaMask, they will give you a private key, which is a set of, um, letters and, and words that is only for you that will give you access to your entire wallet and all of your funds. Um, but you also have a public wallet address, which would essentially be a public key that you can send to other people in order to receive funds and verify your wallet address. So we see here the private key and the public key. 
Then, in 1981, David Chom, a computer scientist from Berkeley, published a paper on untraceable electronic mail, return addresses, and digital pseudonyms. And this was the paper that he wrote、um, here. And it says a technique based on public key cryptography is presented that allows an electronic mail system to hide who a participant communicates with, as well as the content of the communication, in spite of an unsecured underlying telecommunication system. The technique does not require a, university, a universally trusted authority. One correspondent can remain anonymous to a second while allowing the second to respond via untraceable return address. The technique can also be used to form rosters of untraceable digital pseudonyms from selected applications. Applicants retain the exclusive ability to form digital signatures corresponding to their pseudonyms. Elections in which any interested party can verify that the ballots have been properly counted are possible if anonymously mailed ballots are signed with pseudonyms from a roster of registered voters. Another use allows an individual to correspond with a record keeping organization under a unique pseudonym, which appears in a roster of acceptable clients. And this was really supposed to be seen as paper mail. So the paper mail that you send most of the time is private. It's a criminal offense to open somebody else's mail.、Uh, we have the envelope. Which has the, the receiver's address on it, but we do not know what is inside of that envelope, so that communication is private. With email, right now, unless you're using an encryption、uh, software, it is public, right? People can have access to your communications, what you are sending and saying, and a lot of it、um, is extremely public. So, this was an attempt. Or a solution to also bring the laws that we have with private paper mail into the digital age and into our digital communications. David Chom also wrote a second paper called Blind Signatures for Untraceable Payments, which addressed concerns about the automated payment process that was currently being developed and proposed a system that would allow for private payments while addressing the risk. Of criminal use for payment processes.、Um, in the paper, it says that、uh, consumer payments such as transportation, hotels, restaurants, movie theaters, lectures, food, pharmaceuticals, alcohol, books, periodicals, dues, and religious and political contributions all tell a great deal about the person. In the paper, he proposed a new kind of cryptocurrency which allowed for automated payments with the following properties. One, an inability for third parties to identify payee, time, or amount of payments made by an individual. Two, ability for individuals to provide proof of payment or to determine the identity of the payee under exceptional circumstances. And three, the ability to stop use of payments media reported stolen. In this was Digicash. So, Digicash was born using public key cryptography and used a digital currency called Cyberbucks. During this time, the cypherpunks formed. This was a group of people that really sought to have privacy as an individual right. They saw that freedom was predicated on privacy, and if you don't have privacy, you don't have freedom. They thought that if cryptography was outlawed, then only outlaws would have cryptography, or in that sense, if privacy was outlawed, then only outlaws would have privacy. Uh, because of this,、uh, Eric Hughes wrote the Cypherpunk Manifesto. The Cypherpunk Manifesto reads Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know, but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. If two parties have some sort of dealings, then each has a memory of their interaction. Each party can speak about their own memory of this. How could anyone prevent it? 
One can pass laws against it, but the freedom of speech, even more than privacy, is fundamental to an open society. We seek not to restrict any speech at all. If many parties speak together in the same forum, each can speak to all the others and aggregate together knowledge about individuals and other parties. The power of electronic communication has enabled such group speech, and it will not go away merely because we might want it to. Since we desire privacy, we must ensure that each party to a transaction have knowledge only of that which is directly necessary for that transaction. Since any information can be spoken of, we must ensure that we reveal as little as possible. In most cases, personal identity is not salient. When I purchase a magazine at a store and hand cash to the clerk, there is no need to know who I am. When I ask my electronic mail provider to send and receive messages, my provider need not know whom I am speaking or what I am saying or what others are saying to me. My provider only need know how to get the message there and how much I owe them in fees. When my identity is revealed by the underlying mechanism of the transaction, I have no privacy. I cannot here selectively reveal myself. I must always reveal myself. Therefore, privacy is an open society, requires anonymous transaction systems. Until now, cash has been the primary of such system. An anonymous transaction system is not a secret transaction system. An anonymous system empowers individuals to reveal their identity when desired and only when desired. This is the essence of privacy. Privacy is an open society also requires cryptography. If I say something, I want it heard only by those for whom I intend it. If the content of my speech is available to the world, I have no privacy. To encrypt is to indicate the desire for privacy, and to encrypt with weak cryptography is to indicate not too much desire for privacy. Furthermore, to reveal one's identity with assurance when the default is an anonymity requires the cryptographic signature. We cannot expect governments, corporations, or other large faceless organizations to grant us privacy out of their benefits. It is to their advantage to speak of us, and we should expect that they will speak. To try to prevent their speech is to fight against the realities of information. Information does not just want to be free, it longs to be free. Information expands to fill the available storage space. Information is rumor's younger, stronger cousin. Information is fleeter of foot, has more eyes, knows more, and understands less than rumor. We must defend our own privacy if we expect to have any. We must come together and create systems which allow anonymous transactions to take place. People have been defending their own privacy for centuries with whispers, darkness, envelopes, closed doors, secret handshakes, and couriers. The technologies of the past did not allow for strong privacy, but electronic technologies do. We, the cypherpunks, are dedicated to building anonymous systems. We are defending our privacy with cryptography, with anonymous mail forwarding systems, with digital signatures, and with electronic money. Cyberpunks write code. We know that someone has to write software to defend privacy, and since we can't get privacy unless we all do, we're going to write it. We publish our code so that our fellow cypherpunks may practice and play with it. Our code is free for all to use worldwide. We don't much care if you don't approve of the software we write. We know that software can't be destroyed and that a widely dispersed system can't be shut down. Cypherpunks deplore regulations on cryptography, for encryption is fundamentally a private act. The act of encryption, in fact, removes information from public realm. Even laws against cryptography reach only so far as a nation's border and the arm of its violence. Cryptography will inevitably spread over the whole globe and with it the anonymous transaction systems that make it possible. For privacy to be widespread, it must be part of a social contract. People must come together and deploy these systems for the common good. Privacy only extends so far as the cooperation of one's fellows in society. We, the cypherpunks, seek your questions and your concerns and hope we may engage you so that you do not deceive yourselves. We will not, however, be moved out of our course because some may disagree with our goals. The cypherpunks are actively engaged in making the network safer for privacy. Let us proceed together onward. And that was written on March 9th, 1995.
The cypherpunks also started to have meetups and created a cryptography mailing list, which was kind of like a message board where people would post their findings and have discussions about cryptography and privacy. And if you are interested in further investigation of cypherpunk, uh, a great book on that is Cypherpunk Ethics, Radical Ethics for the Digital Age. In 2007, the onshore dollars and offshore dollars began to separate, and in 2008, the U.S. entered into what is now known as the Great Recession. Um, this is also marked by the fall of like the housing market crash, where people were getting loans for houses that they couldn't actually afford because of certain interest rates, and it created kind of like a ripple effect, and we saw a fall of some major banks. Um, so 46 days after the fall of Lehman Brothers on October 31st, 2008, the Bitcoin white paper was sent to the cryptography mailing list. And this here we can see the cryptography mailing list and we see Bitcoin, uh, P2P, eCash paper, the email on cryptography mailing list that announced Bitcoin publicly to the world. So the author or authors in question named Satoshi Nakamoto stuck around for a little bit, but then kind of disappeared. Um, so it says, I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. Uh, it then takes us to the Bitcoin white paper um, and it shares the main properties, which kind of shares that uh, Bitcoin solved double spending where a person can't spend the same coins twice. Um, and yeah. It says it's a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. It will allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without the burdens of going through financial institutions. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hashed-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as honest nodes control the most CPU power on the network, they can generate the longest chain and outpace any attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcasted on a best effort basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof of what will happen uh, while they were gone. Uh, what happened while they were gone. This is the Bitcoin white paper. Again, uh, it kind of shares the beginning statement that we just read and gives you an introduction. It shares a little bit about what's actually going on with the transactions and what essentially has been proposed with um, how this payment system works in order to verify payments and in order to stop double spending. And of course, to have um, not necessarily anonymity, but pseudonymity. So the individual could have a pseudonym and not necessarily have to share their uh, true identity. Here we kind of come to the end of today's mini tutorial. We saw the progression of public key cryptography coming out and being presented to the public and, uh, and individuals being able to have private communication using both uh, a public key and a private key. And that could be used for um, electronic digital communication with emails. It can be used to encrypt text messages. It can be used to, um, you know, use digital communication in an encrypted way. Uh, but we also see it with proof of payment systems and not having to go through a, a centralized third party in order to have trusted payments because an individual uh, with the receiver and seller could use those public keys and private keys in order to verify and authenticate payment transactions. So this is something for you to investigate further um, on your own and you can check out any of the links that I have added into the description of the video below. You can investigate uh, the difference between decentralized and centralized blockchains, decentralized and centralized cryptocurrencies, um, why people use Bitcoin as both a savings tool and or a life-changing currency where they can own their own money at this point in time. 
um, but also look into different privacy mechanisms, what is truly private, what is anonymous, what is pseudonymous, and why individuals like um, Nick Batia think Bitcoin is more akin to gold in terms of a layered currency or layered money. And maybe that's something to get into on a different uh, tutorial. But these are just things to consider as you go forward. And I hope that kind of brief history of some of the events uh, helped you in some way or was at least interesting. And I will leave below a number of articles and also detail in more depth what was really happening with the cypherpunk movement and the individuals involved in creating a lot of the privacy software that is still available today.